We're going to start with prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your mercies, your compassion, your love, and we thank you that we have the opportunity to be here together, to hear your word spoken. Speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you were to ask Janice, my wife, what my favorite time of the year would be, she wouldn't hesitate to tell you that that time is summer. Sorry, don't mean to disappoint anyone. I'm not a fan of the cold. Winters are way too long and the snow sticks around three months longer than I think is reasonable. I'm sure some agree with me. But at the same time, I have to admit, given that I don't have a choice in, in the matter, I've long accepted that which I cannot change. Almost sounds like a prayer, doesn't it? So I've adjusted my thinking and make the most of it by looking for some measure of good in the frosty air. Like a little kid who's anxious for snow to be able to make a snow fort or to, for snow to the first snowfall so I can swoop down some hill on a toboggan. I've learned to grasp at any little thing that can cheer my spirits and what could otherwise be what might some, uh, some might call a dark shadow in time. So sometime starting somewhere in November in anticipation of what I know is coming and realizing that the Christmas season seems to always fly by so quickly anyway, so I've de determined to make the most of what I know is coming. Yes, there are some fun things that happen during this time of the year. It's fun to search for that perfect gift for that special person in your life. Taking the early drive through the community at night to check out all the pretty colored lights neatly displayed on houses and trees gives me a warm feeling just as it does probably most of you as of last year i even got excited about cutting down that perfect balsam fir at the local tree farm and spending an afternoon with my wife quietly decorating the tree with tinsel and lights and pretty ornaments while soft music played in the background now i know it's supposed to be about the birth of christ and I can just about hear the proverbial purist objecting to the fact that the 25th of December was nowhere near the date that Jesus was born. But it's not about the date, folks. And neither is it about the birth of some pagan deity. From what I can tell, it's about the fact that one of the greatest events in the history of mankind happened. And quite frankly, I think it deserves our attention. I'm not so concerned about the timing as I am that thought has been given to this credible, incredible event. Inspiration tells us in the book uh, Adventist Home, it says this, it says, you will find it a difficult matter to pass over this period without giving it, giving it some attention. Did you catch that? You're going to have a hard time not giving it some attention. So you may as well give it some attention is basically what is being said. It can be made, she goes on to say, it can be made to serve a very good purpose. Her counsel is not to shun it, but rather to take advantage of it. What a perfect opportunity at a time when folks around us are maybe more sensitive and open to the story of Christ's birth to share with them something about the appearing of God on earth. Even the prophet Isaiah, centuries prior to this event, made a, made a fuss with prophetic words such as, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. In the very first pages of the New Testament, Matthew pointed out to Joseph, uh, pointed out to Joseph that Mary would bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And then he goes on to say this, he says, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the Lord through the prophet, the, the prophet Isaiah in particular, saying, behold, a virgin, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son 
and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being translated God with us. The fact that a woman would give birth to a child while still a virgin ought to give every deep thinker serious thought. Either it's in the realm of make-believe, of magic or fairy dust, or it's one of the most amazing evidences of the power of a creator God. He can do this. Now, you might be tempted to look over this part of the sacred narrative, but the prophets of both the Old and New Testaments didn't shy away from it, and I don't think we should either. Don't think that for the moment I'm, I'm giving license to the materialism that we see all around us in the world in our present age. I'm not. As the inspired word points out, it says God, and this is again from Adventist Home, page 482, God would be well pleased with us if on Christmas each church would have a Christmas tree on which shall be hung offerings great and small for these houses of worship. Just a little bit like what we have here. Letters of inquiry have come to, to us asking, shall we have a Christmas tree? Will it not be like the world? And we answer, well, you can make it like the world if you have a disposition to do so, or you can make it as unlike the world as possible. There is no particular sin in selecting a fragrant evergreen and placing it in our churches. But the sin lies in the motive which prompts to action and the use which is made of the gifts placed upon the tree. The truth is, Luke, the Apostle Luke, was so inspired by the Holy Spirit concerning the birth of Christ that he devoted the better part of a full chapter laced with some of the most uplifting language in Scripture. I want you to turn, if you have your Bible with you, turn with me to Luke chapter 2, to that very familiar story. Luke chapter 2. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, beginning with verse 6. We're not going to read the whole thing, but I do want to read the part that is so important to us. So Luke chapter 2, verse 6, so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. This is Mary. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. The first thing this passage does is it points to the incredible condescension on the part of God. Prior to this event, who in their wildest dream would have ever imagined the sovereign of the universe, the entire universe, showing up anywhere in such a lowly fashion? You know, a few years ago, I invited Subod Pandit to come to our camp meeting at Pugwash to share with us thoughts, different uh, ideas that he had to share, wonderful messages. Now, remember him saying, you know, he says, when you hear something that you think you're impressed with, when you hear something that, that sounds so marvelous or whatever, you should say, wow. He called it the wow factor. Well, folks, I think this is one of those moments. To think that the majesty on high stooped down to the level of a man, not a... a at his most glorious moment when first made in the image of God, but at his lowest level of degradation. I don't know about you, but once or twice a year, when I take time to ponder his lowly birth in this world, I put my hand across my mouth and I stand in awe. I mean, think of it. 
Just for a moment, think of it. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords lying in a manger in a stinking cattle barn in the form of a human at his weakest and most vulnerable point of time. A baby. This, to me, deserves a wow. There isn't a single fiction writer in the entire world who could have come up with a more incredible story, but there it is in the sacred writings of scripture. Now, if you don't get anything out of my message this morning, at the very least, I hope you get this. You could say the very first lesson we should get from the first pages of the New Testament is a lesson in humility. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. His only thought from the very foundation of the world was your salvation. From his lowly birth to his death on a cross, his only concern was for you and me. Just what exactly did it cost him to rescue you from doom and condemnation? Paul very graphically describes it in his epistle to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verses uh, 6 to 8. He says, who being in the form of God, now just picture this, Be being in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he wasn't grabbing, I want to be the best, I want to be the, the, the strongest, I want to be the most powerful, the most famous, or anything. Who being God was willing to come to this world made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant. Do you know what a bond servant is? It's just another word for a slave. He was willing to become a slave for you and for me. And coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. My dear friends, there can be no better portrayal of selflessness, of condescension than what we have here, the humility of Christ. From a cattle stall to a criminal's cross is a picture of God no pen could ever have dreamt of. You couldn't invent this stuff. You know, in Ernest Gordon's true account of life in a World War II Japanese prison camp through the Valley of the Kwa, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, K-W-A-I, Kwa, Kwe, whatever. But in any case, there is a story that never fails to move me, the author says. It's about a man who, through giving it all away, literally transformed a whole camp of prisoners. They were soldiers. Now, this man's name was Angus Megalivery. Not sure if I pronounce it right. Angus was a Scottish soldier, a prisoner in one of the camps filled with Americans and Australians and Britons who had helped build the infamous bridge over the River Kwai. The camp had become an ugly situation. A dog-eat-dog -dog mentality had set in. Allies would literally steal from each other and cheat each other. Men would sleep on their packs and yet have, their, have those packs stolen from the, under their heads. Survival was everything. The law of the jungle prevailed until the news of Angus's death spread throughout the camp. No one could believe Big Angus had succumbed. He was strong. He was one of, uh, one of those whom they had expected would probably be the last one to die. And actually, it wasn't the fact that his death, about his death, that shocked the men, but the reason he died. Finally, they pieced together the true story. The Argyles, Scottish soldiers, took their buddy system very seriously. Their buddy was called their mucker. And these Argyles believed that it was literally up to each of them to make sure their Argyle survived the war. Angus's mucker, though unfortunately, was dying. And everyone had given up on him, everyone, of course, except for, for Angus. 
He had made up his mind that his friend would not die. Someone had stolen his mucker's blanket. And so Angus gave him his own, telling his mucker that he had uh, just come across an extra one. Wouldn't you know it? And likewise, every mealtime, Angus would get his rations and take them to his friend, stand over him and force him to, to eat them again, stating that he was able to get extra food somewhere. Angus was going to do anything and everything to see that his buddy got what he needed to recover. But as Angus' mucker began to recover, Angus collapsed, slumped over, and died. The doctors discovered that he had died of starvation, complicated by exhaustion. He had been giving his own food and shelter. He had given everything he had, even his very life. The ramifications of his acts of love and unselfishness had a startling impact on the compound. You've heard the verse, right, in John 15, 12, greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. As words circulated of the reason for Argyll's death, the feel of the camp began to change. Suddenly, men began to focus on their mates, their friends, and humanity of living beyond survival, of giving oneself away. They began to pool their talents. One was a violin maker, another was an orchestra leader, another was a cabinet maker, another one was a, a professor. And soon the camp had an orchestra full of homemade instruments and a church called the Church Without Walls that was so powerful, so compelling, that even the Chinese guards attended. Or Japanese guards rather, not Chinese. The men began a university, they began a hospital, a library system. The place was completely transformed on all but smothered love revived, all because one man named Angus gave all that he had for his friend. For many of those men, this turnaround meant survival. What happened is an awesome illustration of the potential unleashed when one person actually gives it all away. Long before the horrors of the cross, even before coming to a bleak and cold cattle shed in the outskirts of Bethlehem, we can even go back prior to the invasion of sin on earth, God so loved the world. He gave his only son. He couldn't bear the thought of losing you. He would go to whatever length it took to ensure your survival, even if it meant going to the point of death, the death of the cross. In some sense, you might say that it all started in a manger in Bethlehem. Some would be tempted to think Christ's sacrifice took place at the cross, and of course that's true, but only partly so. Because if the truth be told, when the most powerful being in the universe stooped to the level of a helpless human baby, you realize just when it was that his sacrifice all began. That's when every one of us should unashamedly blast a big, wow. But here's the thing. You will find it difficult, a difficult matter to pass over this period without giving it some attention. It can be made to serve a very good purpose. You can make it like the world if you have a disposition to do so, or you can make it as unlike the world as possible. The choice is left with each one of us. You can take advantage of the season to reach out to family, friends, remind them of what the fuss is really all about. Like the Apostle Paul in Athens, when he addressed the pagan worshipers and he, he looked for what they had in common and he used it to introduce them to the true God. Well, we too can look for the good and emphasize the good. Even if the world is intent on secularizing the event, we don't have to. We know what it's all about. It's our opportunity, folks, 
to tell that part of the story we only hear about at this time of the year, the story of a God who was willing to leave behind all of his majesty and glory for a bed made of hay. When you take time to seriously think about it, what more can we say except, wow, wow. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we stand in awe of you. What a God, what a Savior. How can we spend so much time in our days ignoring you, forgetting about you, getting so caught up in our own little problems, our own little world that forget, that we forget a God who loves to such an extent. Oh Lord, in heaven we, st we stand here. We don't know what to say except praise the Lord. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for sending Jesus here to be like us and to show us a better way. Amen. Thank you for eternity. We look forward to being in your kingdom forever is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.